So I get a unique opportunity this morning to draw attention to our pastor, which he loves. He's rolling his eyes. Draw attention, but not just to draw attention, but to bring honor to him. Uh, if you don't know, it is Pastor Appreciation Month. Woo! Aren't you glad we have a pastor that we love to celebrate? Yes. It's not an obligation. It's an opportunity, and it's a privilege and an honor to honor him. So uh, real quick, I was privileged to be reading this week um, in the book of Luke. I won't preach for too long um, because we want the pastor to preach. But I couldn't help myself because I read this, and I was like, this reminds me of our pastor. And so this is where Jesus has been talking about the cost of following him. He sent out the 72 at this point. He sends them two by two to go before him um, to tell them, he says, and go and heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So he sent them out to do this. And on their way back, it says, if you jump down, the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And immediately he said to them, this is Jesus saying to all the people that are so excited that they've been preaching about Jesus, they've been sharing his name, and they've seen demons subject to his name. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. But, if there's a but, you should listen after. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And I read that and I was like, this is so a picture of our pastor who doesn't rejoice in the authority, though he has it, and he, he has seen blind eyes open. He has seen physical bodies healed. He has been in the presence of these things and witnessed them. But never for a day will you see our pastor rejoice and boast in that authority. But he boasts in the grace of God. He boasts that there are names written in heaven because of the authority that God has graced him with. He's shared the numbers with us before. It's, his goal is 10,000. To see 10,000 thousand souls turn to Jesus. Have you ever heard that from anybody else in your life? You can answer. Yes, Billy Graham. Pastor Dan and Billy Graham, that is a great boat to be in. There we go. So, but in my life, I know that I don't know anyone personally whose soul purpose is to see 10,000. Is it 6,000 something, I think, at this point? So he rejoices in the names that are written in heaven. And I thought about that. What, a, what an honor to follow a pastor like that who we can mirror ourselves and we don't have to rejoice in our success. We don't have to rejoice in the ladder that we climb, but we get to rejoice in the grace that God has given us and that our names are written in heaven. And because of that, we get to lead people into that place. So pastor, I want to honor you for being this type of man, this type of pastor, this type of leader and mentor and husband and father, that your heart truly is just about seeing the lost saved. That is such a missing component to pastors, to this world, to our daily lives. So thank you for being that. Um, I want to pray for you all together. Can you come stand? Kelly asked for this, so it's the only reason I'm, I'm kidding. Y'all can, you know, Pastor Dan has us do this. I want to have y'all do it too. If, if you're comfortable, stretch your hands out. It's just a sign of agreement and that God would bless them. So God, we, we thank you for our pastors. We thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you for their commitment to you to your presence, to seeing hearts turn to you, to names being written in heaven, because that's all that it's about. God, I pray that, that this year, that this season, Lord, you've brought them together and you say, what God has brought together, no man can separate. And another translation says, no one can tear asunder. And that word means to be put in two separate places. 
Because things that are in separate places don't see the same things or hear the same things or feel the same things. But God, you've brought them together to be one. Our pastors, our leaders, our spiritual father and mother. So God, we thank you that this year is going to be a year of such abundance and such overflow. God, where what they have fought for and what they've been on their knees for and what they have laid everything down for and brought their family into, the things that we don't even see, God, you are going to return to them such a blessing, such a blessing, Lord, that nothing, nothing would compare to it. But God, we pray protection over Pastor Dan, Pastor Kelly, Eve, Jake, Logan, and Eden. Cover them with your blood. Keep their minds safe. Guard their hearts from this world because they all are one. And we honor them. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Hey, Cornerstone. So Dan doesn't know I'm doing this, so I'm sure he's super thrilled right now. Um, So I don't know if you know me, my name is Jeanette, and I worked with Pastor Dan seven years, an eternity, probably could be more like it, but um, we wanted a way to honor him, and a way that we can honor him is to serve, is to serve the church that he's built, is to serve the church that God has built, and um, they're going to put a slide up right now. And there's a couple of serve teams that I want to highlight. This doesn't mean that these are better than others. These are just the ones I have written down. <laughs> but um, I want you to know that that's the best way we can serve him. We can give him dinner and honor his family by babysitting their kids or letting them, you know, buying them a meal or sending them on a trip. But the best way to serve is to fill his church with people that want to serve God. So there are ways for you to serve kids ministry is a huge need that allows all of you guys to come in here and praise and worship and um, we definitely that is a huge need students men's ministry women's ministry we have a hospitality team we have a setup and tear down we've got chad mcgugan back there if you want to know how to do that i mean none of this is possible without that setup and tear down team we have a worship team and band if you want to know anything about that, you can talk to Jenny or Chris Tondre or Chris, um, who's right here. <laughs> um, hospitality, coffee. Guys, we're not going to be, you know, fueled to worship if we walk in and we don't have cold brew from Chad or coffee from the many people that make the coffee. <laughs> um, it's just a small little thing. But we've got greeters and a prayer team and young adults and every, you name it. We've also got... Um, Parkers, I mean, you know, Dan talked about it this morning. There's kind of a maze going on out there. If you don't know how to get in or out, we're not coming. So that is the best way to do it. So I'm going to lead you to this little card that you have on your chairs. Um, If it fills your heart, pray about it. Sign up to serve. It's the best thing you can do to honor Dan. He really, um, out of all of the people that I've heard from, all of the pastors that I've learned from, growing up in the church, Dan is the only one that I ever felt compelled and um, inspired to go out into the world and share my testimony and my gifts with all of you and with everybody else in Austin and whoever. Um, You've really changed my life. I wanted to read something to you guys. I'm nervous. I go live on Facebook all the time. This is nothing like that, just so you know. Okay. A pastor never gets to say, I'm off duty. Never gets to punch out at five. Never gets to have a normal schedule. We don't know how many sleepless nights they spend on their knees praying for their church. How much opposition they face. How many family opportunities they miss to meet with hurting people. We can't carry their burden for them, but we can. But what we can do what the Bible tells us to. Pray for them, encourage them, support them. By blessing them, we will only be blessed in return. So I ask you to please fill out a card. Please think about it deep down and serve your church. Thank you, Dan.
I just like looking here at Chris playing sitting softly in the background. Should we stay there the whole time while I preach or should we let him go? You got an organ function on there? You can kind of hit the high parts? Because David was fighting Goliath. All right, well, thank you guys. Uh, it, it is indeed an honor to be uh, the pastor of Cornerstone. Thank you for being who you are. Enough of that crap, okay? Let's just move on, all right? I, I do want to kind of move on and transition from that, but I appreciate you guys being here. Um, you guys are the real MVPs. You want to know why? It is a four-day weekend. It was Red River Rivalry Weekend, and you're still in church. So give yourself a round of applause for being in church, right? Good work, you. So we're going to start off uh, with a word of prayer. Uh, so why don't you say this with me? We, we do the same thing every time. Let's bow your heads with me. Say this with me. Say, God, help me get everything I need to get. Because sometimes I don't get it. So God, help me to get it and not forget it. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. And amen. Well, I am thrilled that we get to be here, and we're going to get into God's Word, and we're going to get after it today. Uh, we've been in a series, okay, that's called What If, right? Say what if. What if. And we've been walking through the pillars that we're going to build Cornerstone on. We just celebrated a one-year anniversary, and the miracles and the provision of God are real, okay? I want to explain something to you. Because you may just walk into church and go, oh, it's neat. Oh, it sounds decent. Oh, I'm sitting in the snow section. That's fantastic. Oh, <laughs> I'm experiencing purgatory. I should make better decisions. Huh. No, I'm kidding. This is kind of the warmer side. This here over here, there's a little bit of frostbite, which is why I sit there, because it's just about right. Okay? But all this happens, and all this is happening around us because God said plant a church. And we have a church here that was not planted by any other church. It wasn't financed or funded or sent. I can sit in front of you and say with confidence and integrity that no other church has given one penny to see Cornerstone succeed and thrive. I don't say that as a slight on any other church. I say that because how good is God that he provides miracles and provides for us every week? It's unbelievable, okay? And right now, you've got a lot of room to spread out. You want to know why? Because our people are so blessed that they're away for the weekend. Come back next Sunday. You're going to be sitting out in the back, right? Because it's packed in. And God has done incredible things here. And I want you to know that is not normal. 95% of church plants fail in the first year. 95. Not only have we survived, but we have thrived, and we want to kind of sit, go through some of these pillars and say, here is what we're going to be. Last week we talked about being gracious, to give grace, to be grace dealers. How many of you guys went out and gave a little grace away last week? Thank you for three of you. That's great. It's fantastic. Okay, go out there and just give some people some grace. How many of you guys need more grace? Okay, see, you people that didn't raise your hand, go give them some after service. See how that works? I just connected it. But we're going to continue on with what if... We led with honor. Now, this is awkward as awkward can be to preach about honor because I had no idea what they were going to do this morning. You want to know why? Because if they told me, I would have shut it down. <laughs> if I would have had any inkling, I would have been like, mm-hmm, no, just give me the mic, <laughs> okay? But we're still going to follow through with what we're going to be as a church, and we will be a church that is built upon honor. Honor is a lost integrity trait. It's a lost code. It's a lost characteristic in the community we live in today. It's not very honoring. It could take you about two minutes to figure out that we have lost something when it comes to honor. And at Cornerstone, we will build upon honor. Why? Because honor is one of the currencies of the kingdom of God. God builds off of honor. God does things when you honor others. You've heard it said this way so many times. You know what? You want my respect? Try earning it. How many of you guys have ever heard that before? Someone say, you want my respect? Earn it. You guys heard that, right? Yeah. That's messed up. 
just so you know. That is messed up. I'm not saying that people shouldn't earn respect. I'm not saying that certain people demand respect and they need to spend more time establishing a foundation and a history and a pattern for people to respect them. But how many of you know in our country today, we have generations on generations, not just the next generation. I said generations on generations that have forgotten how to respect people. Why? Because men of God have not stood up in pulpits and said, we're going to be about honor. Because regardless of whether or not you earn my respect or not, I am thankful for the men and women that have bled and died for this country. They didn't have to earn anything from me because they sacrificed their family to keep us free. They, they don't have to earn anything from me as they patrol our roads, as they keep us safe. They don't have to try to earn something from me. I'm just going to give honor and respect where it's due because the kingdom of God is built on honor. It is the currency of the kingdom. And there's one major thesis that I feel like as I prayed for you that God said, here's what I want them to know. The kingdom of God is built upon honor. It's built upon honor. And it affects almost every relationship. It affects so many relationships. So I've got a few written down here, and we'll point you to Scripture with these. The Lord. Ready? It affects your relationship with the Lord. This is what it says. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with your first fruits and all your produce, and your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. Honor the Lord. Honor him with your first fruits. Just so you know, what honor him with your first fruits is this. It's 10%. It's tithe. It's what God gives you. The scripture tells you it's he who gives you the power to create wealth. The first 10%, the reason why God did that was to establish a pattern with you so you don't think you're providing for you. He said, I want to provide for you. And if you honor me this way, I'll make sure that the rest is handled and taken care of. I don't know about you, but that's one of the best deals I've ever heard of. I hear resounding amens everywhere. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. If I could guarantee you that if you gave me 10% of your income, that I would make the other 90% always provide, you'd never lack, and I'd give you more than you could ever think, ask, dream, or imagine, would you do it? You would. I've got financial advisors sitting here in the room. Is that a good investment? It's a good investment? Good. Meanwhile, the church argues over tithe. If I promised you that as a financial advisor, you might trust me and say, okay, we can get you maybe 10% back. God is saying, I will take the other 90% and I will bless you. I will blow your mind with how I provide for you. And the worst thing that you could do is get this confused with me needing money from you. I don't need any money from you. What I need is for you to do what God's called you to do because God wants to bless you. You're like, oh, that's real convenient. We know how this works. We know how you get paid. It's the tithe. Wrong. I take 10% of my money and I give it back to the Lord. It's God who provides for me. So it doesn't matter if the church can pay me or not. God provides. How do I know? It happened. When I left one church and God said, go to another church to learn how to train and get ready to plant a church, I took a 40% reduction in pay. Four zero. My wife and I flew out to Park City because I knew I was going to have to do a lot of convincing on this one. And Park City seemed like a place to distract her enough to be able to convince her to do it. <laughs> and the truth is, I needed convincing. We're sitting there in this beautiful house. And she goes, what did God say? I said, he said to do it. And she goes, so what are you waiting for? I said, these numbers don't add up. I cannot make our bills get paid with these numbers. I can't take a 40% reduction and still pay the bills and be a responsible father. And she goes, what did God say? As he said, do it. She goes, then do it. I kid you not. You can confirm with her. You can even confirm with my father-in-law and my mother-in-law because they were there the first month 
that I stopped the other job and started the new one and I got 40% less, there was a family who called and said, God said we're supposed to send you our tithe. And they didn't even come to our church or live in our city. You know how much their tithe every month was? 40% delta. You should clap a lot louder for that. That was good. This is not a message on tithe. This is a message on the faithfulness of God. And when you honor him with the very first of what you have, he says, I'll provide. God is not up there going, oh, I need a bull. I need a ram. I need a goat. Can we have someone? Yeah, have them sacrifice them. That's what we need. He's like, I need 10 bucks. Let's have Dan collect up some money. So that way, hey, Michael, are you short? I'm short on 10. I need 10 bucks. And he sends us to collect money. No, God is establishing a system for you where he says, if you trust me, if you believe and you have faith and you honor this, I will provide for you so you don't have to be responsible to provide for yourself. He will give you the ability. It doesn't mean you don't go to work. It doesn't mean you're not a wise steward. It just means that God is showing you a principle in his word. So the first place is honoring the Lord. Another, another relationship is parents and children. And this is what it says in Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. And it says children. Everybody say children. Yes. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. This is real simple. You've read this before. I want to highlight a few concepts that you may have not noticed. What is the expiration date on children honoring their parents? It doesn't expire. I'll tell you this much. The older you get, the more tricky it becomes. Because you need to learn to honor in different ways. You need to understand that it gets sometimes very tricky to honor mom and dad as they age. But the Bible says, children, obey your parents and honor your father and mother. And don't provoke them. I will tell you this much. If you won't lead with honor, they won't follow with honor. They won't. If you don't lead with honor, they won't follow with honor. It's almost like you can see it as a recipe. If you're seeing them lead with dishonor, know that it's because it's probably been sown. It's been shown. And it gets it from somewhere. And we have to start sowing honor because we don't want to reap dishonor. And one thing that, I don't know, you guys, you guys have pet peeves. Anybody here have pet peeves, things that drive you nuts? I got a couple of them. One, when you chew with your mouth open, okay, or make mouth noise, I literally believe you were sent here to test me. <laughs> my salvation, okay, my joy, all the things that are good. That's just a pet peeve of mine, right? And I'm just like, oh, I can hear lips smacking. Literally one time in New York, I had a youth ministry. The kid loved the Lord. He was just, man, so on fire. And he's just sitting at the end as a t high schooler can do. And he's so excited. He's eating these chips and queso. And how many of you know chips and queso are not quiet, but they're ordained from the Lord. They're so good. Kelly can attest this. The kid was just going after him. He was in the third dimension of the Holy of Holies. He was just... And I literally was sitting right here, and I'm praying. I'm like, God, I don't want to kill him. I'm going to go to jail. That won't work out so good. And then without even a thought, I felt my hand go out and grab his lips. <laughs> and then I realized what I was doing and I'm like I'm holding this student's lips <laughs> and I said well I should take this opportunity to clarify why I'm holding these lips and I said bro I'm going to need you to keep these closed <laughs> for your protection and mine <laughs> so that's one of my pet peeves the other one of my pet peeves is disrespect if my kids are disrespectful I go from zero to 183,476. Anybody else here disrespect? It just gets you. Oh, my gosh. It gets me. 
it drives me insane. And you have to understand, honor is a multiplier, but dishonor divides. When you sow honor, you're multiplying. When you actually sow dishonor, you're dividing. Is there anywhere you can see in our culture today that there's division? Mask, no mask. Black lives matter, blue lives matter. Republican, Democrat. Now, I'm making no statements about either side of either one of those arguments. I care about what Jesus cares about. And if Jesus cares about it, then I care about it. And if it's in his word, then I'm going to follow it and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to multiply honor because honor will multiply and continue to multiply. But if I sow dishonor, all I'm going to do is continue to divide. So we can tell very clearly, what has our nation been doing? Dishonoring. It's more divisive than I've ever seen it in my life. So then what do Christians need to do? Honor. Not because they earned it but because that is a position that demands respect. And therefore, I will give it. Because when I give it, I multiply it. And guess what happens when you give honor? It comes back. But it doesn't come back just the way you sent it. It multiplies it. God is not a cheapskate. Everything that you sow or give in the kingdom of God to God, he sends back and says, oh, you gave two? That's fine, I'll give you 202. Why? Because he's not going to be outdone because he's God and I'm not. And every time you think about whether or not you should do what God is asking you to do, remember, he will multiply, press down, shake it together, and send back an absolute steroid packed blessing for you. Now, it doesn't always come the way you anticipate. Sometimes the blessing comes back in struggle. But there's nothing quite like a struggle to get you to pray, is there? Oh, awkward, quiet. Yeah, one random amen. There's nothing quite like difficulty to get you back on your knees. How do I know? My youngest child, when she was born. You see, we've got four children. What we do is we walk into the hospital. We schedule. Here it is. We're going to induce. A couple hours later, here's a baby. I probably had something good to eat. My wife did a lot of work right? We had one baby. Boom. Now I go, for her it wasn't, there was a lot of work. For me, I was like, hmm, that was kind of quick. I hardly sweat at all. But for her, it was work. First child, second child, third child, fourth child, all of a sudden doctors start rushing into the room. There's no communication happening. All of a sudden, they're taking Eden, they're putting her inside of a plexiglass box, and they're hooking up electrodes, and they're hooking up, and everybody's rushing around, and we're just sitting there. It's like the world slowed down. You ever been in that moment where everything just starts going in slow motion? There's nobody talking, but you can see everybody moving, and it's like you're removed from it. Nothing will force you to pray until your baby's born and being put in a box and hooked up to electrodes. Now, God healed her miraculously and faithfully. Zero issues from that day. But I tell you what, you start praying real heavy when they chopper your daughter out of Lakeway Hospital to St. David's and you're driving behind an ambulance and you have to look at your wife and go, I love you, I have to leave. And she's sitting there in a hospital bed by herself. That moment brings you to your knees And it gets you close to what's critical. It gets you close to what's important. And it all of a sudden drowns away all the distraction and the noise that we get so caught up in each day. Do you guys get distracted? So do I. And there's nothing like a crisis to drive you back there. But let's keep going. Other relationships that it puts together, husband and wife. First Peter 3, 7 says this, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that, everybody say, so that. So that your prayers may not be hindered. Did you read that, men? I don't believe you. 
We'll read it again. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Everybody say, so that. So that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's address two items quickly. One, the people that would go, see, men are more important than women. Number one, you're dumb. That's not what it said at all. I know this is going to come as a shock, but if you put Kelly and I side by side and you put a 1,000 pounds on a sled, all right, and we both tried to pull, mine might move a little easier than Kelly's. Now, let me be clear. There are some women that would outwork me four days in a row, okay? That's not what this is about. What this is about is men learning to honor their wives so that their prayers are not hindered. I don't know about you, but I don't see this scripture read and preached very much. Men, you don't need anything blocking your prayers. Get it right with your wife. I can tell you the number of times I've had to go back and apologize, even when I didn't even think I was wrong. Because like I can't afford to have my prayers not answered. Uh, you know what it does? It forces me back to humility. And if I ask forgiveness for something I didn't do, is that okay? That's a good habit to be in. Now, that rarely happens because she's perfect and I'm the one always screwing up. Right, Cal? Right. But men, you can't afford. You can't afford to have your prayers hindered. We've got to be in touch with the throne of grace. Working government is another relationship. Romans 13, 7 says this, pay to all what is owed, to them taxes whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed. No resounding amens about paying taxes. (laughs) It's awkward, I expected huge amens, but no, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed. And what's the last one? To whom honor is owed if they earn it, right? No. Honor to whom honor is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed because it's a multiplier. Don't miss your moments to honor and to set your culture in a direction that it desperately needs and it's your choice how you choose to honor or not. In a moment when you're driving and you see lights go on behind you, and they're going to help you understand clearly what the laws are, right? Anybody familiar with this? Hmm. Yes, honor. Honor. That's a respected position. It's put in authority for a reason. I'm not having a debate about whether or not there's injustice that happens and that there are some people that make poor choices. That is real. That is very real, and it's never okay. But for you to drive around and disrespect any police officer based on what you saw on the news, that's disrespectful to the kingdom of God. That position is there, and it demands respect. And the accountability that those women and those men have in their life is real. Think about being someone young right now wanting to sign up to be a law enforcement officer. How many guys you think are just, oh, let me get right in line. I'm excited to do that. Do you realize the effect of that? So when you dial 911, who picks up? Or who doesn't pick up? You see, that all starts when you get pulled over and what your kids hear you say about, oh, <laughs> fundraising it has to be their fault, not yours, because the sign doesn't say 55, Right? Everyone's like, I don't know what he's talking about. (laughs) Isn't there a better message? Go back to tithing, pastor. That one's a better one. No. Honor whom honor is owed. Give the honor. Let's keep going. Another relationship. In church, 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Of course I love reading this one. But it's time to restore honor to the pulpit. When men and women give up their lives to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, it costs something. It was hard to listen to Jenny pray when she said, you'll never know the hours. 
There is no nine to five. There's no punching in and out. You know where kids run away? Kids run away on Friday nights. Marriages dissolve at 1 a.m. Now, this isn't a boo-hoo, and look at me, I'm just saying, we need to restore honor here because I don't see a young generation saying, I want to be a pastor. I want to lead the church. I feel a call on my life to lead. And that's because we have disrespected the pulpit and because men of God and women of God have done inappropriate things with the pulpit and abused it. That doesn't give us a right to not say, no, no. This is a high position. This is a divine calling. That there's no better place than to be right in the center of what God's called you to be. In fact, we should honor our elders. This is what Leviticus 19.32 says. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. And you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. The next generation needs to respect the age of the others. Those that have gone before them, those that have plowed the fields, those that have prayed and invested and fasted, those that have poured out grace, those that have built churches, those that have sent missionaries on the mission field, we should be honoring them. My wife's grandfather sitting here on the front row, the number of times that there was a missionary that came to their church and they said, they can stay with us. We'll feed them, we'll house them because the church couldn't afford it and the blessing that they got, and the heritage that they invested in. What you see me do every Sunday is walk over here and kneel and have him pray for me. You have no idea the inheritance I get every time because I get to honor. I get to honor that. You need to honor the next generation. Honor those that have fought well because it's a dying breed, and we need to start breeding honor again. Start building honor again. We need to start being serious about honor. You've got to build honor because honor is the, is the currency of the kingdom of God. I would love for you just to run a systems test on your own honor. How do you show it? How are you doing? How are you doing with it? How do you talk? What do you post? Ooh. Ooh, now he's just getting in our business. What do you post? Because you can hide behind a screen. Don't get me wrong, this is not an anti-social media. Use it for positive. But I can tell you this much. I am slapped tired of people hiding behind a screen thinking they can say whatever they want because they're just typing it on a Twitter. Do you think our world would be better If we had less people tweeting, say amen. Amen. Now, what is on your wall? What is on your post? What are you putting up? Are you encouraging? Are you showing honor? Or are you dividing? Because I promise you, your political post will not change who I vote for. I'll say it one more time. Your post will not change who I vote for. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use biblical principles. I'm going to listen to the Lord. I'm going to say, God, what do you want me to do? Because it's a great honor to vote in our country. You realize our brothers and sisters across the world that are God's sons and daughters who don't have the privilege to vote? You know that, right? And we're complaining about the two candidates we have to choose from? Don't get me wrong. I get it. It's a mess on both sides. Why? Because they're human. Okay? But I get to vote. What do you think our brothers and sisters that love the Lord, God's children, his sons and daughters in China think of us complaining about our choices to vote? What do you think they think about that? It's a little different, isn't it? You see, we have to be about honor, and we have to check ourselves and say, what are we doing? What are we sowing? What are we putting out? Because we're going to get it back, not one-fold. It multiplies. And the truth is, I see so much division. We need people loving each other and being grace dealers. What if we loved? What if we gave away grace? 
And what if we led with honor? We should assume the best in a situation. Lead with honor. Start from a position of honor. To say, I assume that you're not out to get me. I assume that you're for me. I assume that you're behind me. I assume that you have good intentions until you prove otherwise. Is that how we live? How do I know? I'm from the Northeast. I assume you're going to rip me off. I assume you're lying because you were born south of the Mason-Dixon line. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that too real in here? <laughs> right? right? Have you guys never experienced that? Oh, the people from the north, they're rude, right? Ah, the people from the south, well, they're a bunch of fake. They're going to lie. Have you ever experienced this exchange? You guys ever heard this? Yeah. What if we just honored and assumed the best? What if I assume that Jeanette's not trying to get a job from me? She's just trying to be sweet. Because we all know she already went through purgatory for seven years. <laughs> she don't want to go back into it. She graduated on to greener pastures. But what if we assumed that the other one wasn't trying to offend me? If I didn't assume that what you were trying to do was take away from me, me something that's important to me? What if I assumed that God loves you? What if I assumed that God can take care of me regardless of what you do or you don't do? See, that's the Christianity that we're talking about. That's the cornerstone that we're going to build. We're going to build a strong foundation of honor because it's a dying breed. And I don't know about you, but I want to see a next generation who loves the Lord. I want to see a next generation who serves the Lord. I want to see the next generation do better preaching than I ever did. I want to see another young pastor come up out of this congregation and say, 10,000, low bar, let's go. I want to see worship leaders come up out of this house. I want to see missionaries come up out of this house. They go out and start orphanages and see people healed and see people delivered. I want to see people that are Christian counselors come up out of this house. And the way we have to do it is building a culture of honor. Because if we don't, who will? Are you going to leave it to the school? Okay, politically they'll teach them, right? No, politics won't. Oh, colleges will do it, right? Colleges are teaching honor, right? Well, when they get out and they get in the workplace, then they'll figure it out at a job, right? If you don't teach them, who will? And if you don't sow it, you cannot reap it. That's called theft. Sow honor. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I thank you for every person that's here. I pray your blessing on each and every one of them. God, we ask that you would help us to be honoring, to sow honor. Help us to be a church that honors those around us, not because they're perfect, not because they have it all together, but because you do. And God, when we honor, it says more about who we are than the person we are honoring. When others are dishonorable and we choose honor, it says more about us than them. So God, I ask your blessing on this time. Lord, would you steal the words that you've given us? Would you help us to build a generation that honors you and honors those around them? We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate you being here. We're going to have our gentleman take, a, take an offering real quick. But I want to uh, tell you about a few things that are really, really great that are going on at Cornerstone. I have so much stuff on this pulpit. Gosh, so many things. One, um, as the gentlemen go ahead and come, they, they can go ahead and pass those plates. There's a couple different ways that you can give. Uh, they'll put a slide up here so you can see these, um, the, the ways that you can give. You can give inside the baskets. Um, <laughs> There it is. You can text to give. You can give on our website. All those things. Um, but here's what I wanted to show you. We have these cards in the back that are called praise cards. God is doing incredible things. Amen? 
Okay. Well, he is for me, so I'm going to fill out one of these, okay? And if he is for you and you're thankful for what God's given you, man, put it in that box back there, fill out a card. If you have a prayer request, we also have those here. We want to pray for you. We are going to be a praying church. We are going to lift up your request. We're going to put them in front of God and talk about them. Last but not least, Last weekend, we were able to send a bunch of hymnals over to our second campus. Our what campus? Second. That's right. So it took us a year to get two campuses. How cool is that? Right? Yes. This is a handwritten thank you card. A handwritten thank you card from one of the residents there because we sent over hymnals. So that, that way, this afternoon at 3 o'clock... Okay, well, my father-in-law, who pastors that campus, Phil Arce, we wave to let everybody know who we are right here. He goes over there, and he's going to play the piano. He's going to sing with them. He's going to teach them. And on Wednesdays, he does a Bible study. And they wrote a handwritten thank you to say thank you for what you're doing. This is what you're investing in. It's not only the next generation. It's every generation. Okay, you guys are doing it, making it happen. I'm going to pray over you and ask that you, God's blessing and favor on you before you go. Lord, I thank you so much for every person that's here. I ask that you would smile upon them. God, that you would be gracious to them. That, Lord, you would turn your face toward them. Lord, that you would give them peace. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great day. Go pop a balloon on your way out. <laughs>